Hello there and welcome to Global Business Africa. We'll be giving you insight into Africa's business and financial markets. I'm Uche Okoronkwo coming to you from Kenya's capital, Nairobi. Let's start with a look at the markets. Now, emerging market stocks continue to recover from this week's sell-off. We saw MSCI's emerging market stock index up about 0.3% on the day. It is on course for its first week of gains in about a month. Over in Nigeria, stocks extended their rally on Friday to a three-week high on hopes that President Buhari's new cabinet will begin to implement reforms that could lift the country's economic growth. In South Africa, the JSE firmed up just a little today, but did close the day in the red. We saw industrials adding 0.44%. Gold miners had lost about 1.55% on the day. Now, also coming up on the show. Egypt's central bank cuts its lending rates after inflation slows. We look at why employers can no longer ignore the idea of a crash at the office. And a team of plumbers in South Africa develop a water-saving toilet that could address water shortages in the country. Well, let's start off in Egypt, where the central bank has, for the first time in nearly six months, slashed its key interest rates by a further 150 basis points. As a result, the overnight deposit rate now stands at 14.25%. The overnight lending rate is at 15.25%. And the rate on the main operations is at 14.75%. Now, so far, the central bank of Egypt has cut its key rates by a total of 250 basis points points. This is as Egypt's July inflation figures came in significantly below expectations, which of course the Monetary Policy Committee says prompted the latest cuts. However, analysts are expecting further rate cuts with the Egyptian investment bank, CI Capital, forecasting a 1% cut in September this year. Well, staying in the country, Egypt is targeting to establish 100,000 greenhouses by 2022. The project, which will be the largest in Africa and across the Middle East, aims to achieve food security and bridge the gap between production and consumption. Here's CGTN's Yasser Hakim explaining how these new greenhouses are set to benefit the country's economy. The latest inauguration of the state-owned greenhouse projects is part of a plan to increase agricultural production in the country. Egypt imports about 80% of its basic needs. That's why the government had embarked on a major project to cultivate 2 million fedans or hectares of land to reduce the dependence on imported products. The government is expanding the use of greenhouses to achieve its targets. And as Mohammed Al Khirsh explains, the greenhouses add value to the economy. The greenhouses have several advantages over traditional cultivation. First, the crop yield per acre in the greenhouses is at least four times the normal cultivation. So you produce more and export more from the same area of land. Second, water consumption is much less in the greenhouse, which is a focal point because of water scarcity in Egypt. The government is targeting 100,000 greenhouses, and this amount would feed about 20 million people. The greenhouses mainly produce vegetable crops, but also cucumbers, tomatoes, aubergine and carrots. We currently produce about 2.5 million tons of vegetables in the greenhouses, and most of it is exported successfully because of its high quality that adheres to international standards. We expect the number to reach about 3 million tons by next year. And officials are trying to sell the idea for the farmers. We made huge efforts to train our staff on how to establish greenhouses. Our staff in turn have been working extensively to train farmers and create awareness of the importance and profitability of greenhouses. It's an ambitious project, and the target to cultivate 2 million acres of land is expected to be ready in just over two years. Yas Hakim for CGTN, Cairo.
let's now go back to our top story of the day. For the first time in six months, uh, we've seen Egypt's central bank slashing its key interest rates by about 150 basis points. Well, let's delve further into that decision with Adele El Marhoui. He joins us now in Cairo. Great to have you on the show, Adele. Welcome. Now, of course, some analysts did expect the central bank uh, to continue with a more conservative uh, monetary policy rate, given the jitters around uh, the emerging market sell-off we saw earlier in the week and, of course, fears of a slowing global economy. So, Adele, what was the reasoning behind the decision? And suddenly, what was the tone coming out of the MPC's meeting today? Well, actually, Uchi, here in Egypt, um, the expectations was definitely that um, the Egyptian Central Bank was going um, to, in any way, decrease um, the interest rates. It was not still clear, however, would it be in their meeting this month or the following um, meeting. In any case, um, the um, deduction has been around 150 points. Um, the main derivative um, to it is, of course, um, the steady that we've been seeing in um, the foreign currency. In fact, actually, the Egyptian pound for months has been gaining strength over the U.S. dollars, uh, which is now uh, about uh, $1 is worth around 16.5. Five Egyptian pounds. That's one factor. Also, the inflation rates are at their lowest in four years, 8.6%, which is a huge recovery to the Egyptian market. Um, along with the derivative uh, that we've been seeing in the global market uh, and in, in, in many other countries in the United States and Europe, who have been also on a trend to decrease um, their interest rates, along with the challenge that Egypt is going on as an emerging market, all the factors were quite um, strengthening of the position that the uh, government or the, the central bank of Egypt would go for uh, a, a cut in its um, uh, interest rates. And there's actually further expectations uh, as well in that regard. Mm. Now, of course, we have been watching inflation numbers quite closely, uh, Adele, given the recent fuel and electricity price increases uh, that we've seen. Uh, they seem to have had very little effect on inflation numbers. In fact, the rate, like you mentioned, dropped to its lowest in four years to about 8.7 percent. Now, what is the outlook for inflation given uh, the impact of government subsidy cuts and, of course, the reforms that they've been undertaking? Well, it seems that the government economic reforms is starting to be paying off. Um, so basically what we're seeing is that um, as it's 8.6%, the lowest in four years, and expect to at least uh, be steady uh, for the coming months. There is a minor expectation that um, during August, because of the uh, Holy Eid or, or the Islamic uh, Bayram, uh, because of the expense um, increase in that um, period, that there will be a slight hike uh, in uh, the monthly uh, inflation rates. However, it will not affect the trend according to most analysts and most investment firms as well. So the expectation is that Egypt will be going in that trend at least to the end of the year. There are also um, talks about uh, what will happen next for the interest rates from the Egyptian government as well, which seems to be quite positive. Mm. Now, of course, it's quite a positive reform story coming out of Egypt right now, given the slowing inflation numbers, a stable currency, as you mentioned, and of course, a growing appetite uh, for Egypt's bonds, especially from foreign investors. What is the outlook for rates? Could we see further cuts uh, going into uh, the rest of the year? That's definitely what almost every um, entity in Egypt is expecting. Um, some have been quite optimistic to um, project about uh, 500 points further, that's about 5%, um, so that the inflation rates, uh, the interest rates in Egypt, sorry, will go to a single digit, which would be a remarkable um, step for the country. Um, the least expectations in that regard is about 100 further points, at least in the next um, meeting. So there is all indication or all analysts are expecting that the interest rates will once again uh, be cut uh, by the Egyptian Central Bank um, at least until the end uh, of this year, which is a good sign for investment. It's a good sign for those here in Egypt who are, uh, will in fact be um, feeling the effect uh, of that um, 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 decision that has been led by the Egyptian uh, Central Bank. Um, there has been an issue with over liquidity in the banks and this decision should 
start moving and encourage businesses to expand or new business to open as the interest rates are now becoming more attractive uh, when compared to the return uh, over investment that was previously with the high rates was quite impossible or quite at least disappointing for most businesses to enter and uh, try to apply for a loan as it would not be of any significance. Right. Well, as, as always, Adele, great to have your insights on the show. Of course, that's Adele Marhui joining us there in Cairo. Well, let's shift focus now. Take a look at our corporate headlines for the day. Now, the American Export Import Bank is considering a $5 billion loan in order to help build a large liquefied natural gas plant in northern Mozambique. The project is the bank's biggest export financing deal in years. If approved, it will further U.S. President Donald Trump's Prosper Africa initiative, which is designed to boost trade with Africa. And Pan-African downstream oil firm Kennel Cobil has officially been delisted from the Nairobi Securities Exchange, and that's following the acquisition of 100% stake by French company Rubis Energy. Kennel Cobil, which is worth close to 225 million US dollars by market cap, operates in Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and Zambia. Rubis, which has a market value of about $4.7 billion, already has operations in Africa as well as Europe, Central America, and the Caribbean. Meanwhile, Africa's largest company by market value, Naspers, has received enough votes from shareholders to proceed with a listing of international assets, including a stake in China's Tencent Holdings in Amsterdam next month. The multinational internet and media giant needed support from at least 75% of its investors to spin off a newly created entity known as Process NV. It will retain a majority stake in the new group, which will also have investments in internet firms from Germany and the US to India and Brazil. The listing is, of course, scheduled to take place on September 11. And billionaire industrialist David Koch has died at the age of 79. He had been suffering from cancer. Now Koch and his 83-year-old brother Charles ran Koch Industries, which is one of the largest privately held conglomerates in the world. Its investments include subsidiaries involved with manufacturing, refining and distribution of chemicals, fibers as well as minerals. And that's a look at our corporate headlines. Well, we're heading into a short break. Here's a look at what's still to come. Alphabet announces rules which are aimed at stopping predatory lending by apps on its Play Store. And we look at why employers cannot ignore the crash idea for much longer. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global Business. Only on CGTN. Every story starts out like this. Beyond the rush of the numbers, there's always a more fundamental question. What happened? Who has been affected? When market moving decisions are made, who's responsible and why? Let's get some reaction on ground. Joining us in Johannesburg is Sumitra Hello, Nairobi. This well, is how all stories begin. See how they end. Only on Global Business. There's more to this place than just glorious landscapes. There's more to it than just, say, Table Mountain or glorious, endless salt flats. There's more to it than countries that are home to some of the deepest mines in the world. There is so much more to this place, even if it is home to some of the finest diamonds on the planet. 
It is the sheer diversity of the people who call South Africa home and the relentless drive to make it a better place that make it so special. And we know that because this too is home. No one knows South Africa like we do. CGTN, see the difference. Welcome back. Now, Alphabet-owned Google has announced rule changes which are aimed at stopping the deployment of predatory loan applications within its Play Store. Any lending app on its store must now disclose, amongst other things, minimum and maximum repayment periods, the maximum annual percentage rate on its loans, as well as the cost of the loan on offer. Now, any loans which require repayment in 60 days or less, Google says, will not be allowed on the Play Store. Kenya's micro-lending market has grown at an explosive pace in the last five years. The country is now home to at least 49 such digital-only lenders. Kenya's central bank governor has described the segment as one which is rife with predatory lending. Well, let's dig further into the promise as well as the perils of the digital lending market in East Africa. We're joined now by Ivan Mboa. He is the general manager in charge of East Africa at Atala. Now, earlier this week, the firm did announce that it had raised 110 million U.S. dollars in Series D funding. The firm says the funds will be used to expand its product portfolio. Well, let's discuss all this with Ivan. Great to have you with us Thank on you the show today. Well, let's kick off. Uh, the the this segment uh, discussing that new round of funding. Sure. You say these no new funds will be used to support the launch uh, of new tech-driven products and certainly grow your operations mm -hmm. uh, globally. What are your plans? Give us sure. a sense of what your plans are. Um, so we're very excited to have raised this amount of funding. Um, it has three key priorities for the business. We're looking, one, at new markets. So primarily this is India. Uh, we'll be launching in India shortly. And we're also exploring um, new countries in Latin America, Asia Pacific, and also Africa. Um, the second priority that we're looking at is actually new products. Um, so Tala pioneered the smartphone Android-based lending model. So we're thinking about going beyond credit. Um, and so there are a number of new initiatives that we'll be pursuing. Um, some very interesting pilots that we've been running around micro health insurance. Uh, we know that our customers also struggle to both save and um, uh, I'd say send money cheaply, so we want to ideally help them. Um, and the third priority is also looking at beefing up our in-house resources in terms of people. Mm. Yeah. Well, let's talk about these rule changes uh, that are mm. going on in Google. Uh, predatory is a word that seems to come up a lot when we talk about mm. digital lending mm. apps. Will it affect your operations uh, in East Africa and the rest of the world? Uh, what are you going to do? Are you planning to move out of the Play Store in light of these, mm. these, new, these new rules? So our understanding of these new rules is that Google is trying to target predatory lending and specifically U.S. payday lenders. Um, and one of the things that they are quite concerned about is accruing interest. Um, so we as Tala do not um, accrue interest when clients are late. We have very simple and transparent and clear pricing. Um, so we are pretty comfortable with the changes that have been announced. Uh, we believe that as a company that is focused on serving clients in frontier and emerging markets, uh, we would fall out of scope of some of these rules, but of course we wait to see uh, what happens. Mm. Well, here in Kenya, the central bank uh, has also spoken mm -hmm. spoken about these predatory practices. Mm. Quite a number of digital apps in the sector. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, on how this could um, possibly impact the way we'll see policy going? Uh, in terms of these apps yeah. going forward. Of course, the Banking Act, uh, you guys are not regulated under the Banking mm -hmm. Act. So uh, what are your thoughts on how that will go? Sure. So I think the central bank has called out some legitimate concerns. Um, with the growth of digital credit and especially uh, fintech-focused apps, we have seen some abuses of consumer protection. Um, this is in everything from the way in which some lenders are communicating their terms, um, i.e. clients may not necessarily know the full cost uh, we've also seen some abuses in collections practices um, and also in some, to some extent product design. Um, so we do expect uh, to see some form of regulation happening in the market. Um, Tala has joined about 12 other lenders to form the Digital Lenders Association of Kenya. 
and we actually welcome engagement with regulators and government to sort of work together and uh, formulate sensible regulation to sort of tame some of these uh, issues that we're seeing in the market. Mm. How are you going to be handling uh, the fact that the rate cap, uh, the interest rate cap, which was uh, uh, pointed towards the banking sector, uh, it only applies con currently to uh, lending from formal deposit-taking institutions. Now, going forward, do you expect any amendments coming from that uh, directed towards yeah. digital lenders, and how do you plan to handle that? That's a great question. Um, I think, for one, the interest rate cap that's been applied in banks has had a sort of different effect from what perhaps I was intended. Um, it was ideally intended to make sure that customers would enjoy access to credit at affordable rates. But what we're seeing is actually a retraction. And we've seen a number of lenders actually pull back uh, lending through to SMEs, and those actually need credit. Mm -hmm. um, so I would be surprised to see a further extension of this. Um, that being said as well, um, many of us digital lenders, I would say, operate a very different model, right? We're not uh, sort of providing our clients annualized loan facilities, right? We don't have 12-month, right. two-year, three-year products. Uh, many of us are focused on the short end. Mm -hmm. We ideally help our clients bridge gaps around 30 days, 60 days. Mm -hmm. um, and so an interest rate cap may not necessarily make sense. Um, that would be my, our opinion, yeah. Mm. Now, of course, uh, your CEO, your founder and CEO, uh, Shivani Sioria, she said the firm's repayment rate mm -hmm. uh, is at about 92% uh, across five mm -hmm. countries uh, that it operates in. What is, does this still stand here in Kenya as well? Uh, is this a case in Kenya, rather? Uh, and what is your most problematic uh, market when it comes to uh, repayment and non-performing mm -hmm. loans? So we're very happy to announce that we've actually been able to maintain um, our overall lifetime repayment rates um, at that level has been discussed. We also have, um, I'd say, a repeat usage rate of up to 95%. Um, and I'd say the future is quite bright. We don't really have uh, what are called problematic markets, so to speak. We're very much looking at going beyond the existing five countries that we operate in and thinking about how do we reach the other three billion people on this planet who are underserved. Um, so that's, we take a very different approach. I wouldn't say that we have problematic markets. Right. We have some markets that are slightly more mature, such as Kenya, our first market, and others that are brand new, uh, such as India, which we'll be moving into shortly. Mm. Yeah. Well, we we'll certainly love to delve further into that, but we yeah. have to leave it there. Sure. We've run out of time. But thank you so no, much you. Uh, for joining us in the studio. Of course, that was Ivan Mboy. He's the general manager for East Africa uh, for Tala's digital app. Well, let's shift focus now. The lack of facilities for childcare in the office remains a worrying concern around the world. Only two days ago, the Speaker of New Zealand's Parliament attracted global attention for babysitting a legislator's child while keeping order in the House. Last month, a lawmaker in Kenya was asked to leave Parliament for bringing her child to work. Now, some officers, though, understand the gravity of the matter and have in place facilities to take care of a children. CGTN's Deji Badmus visited one of them in Lagos, Nigeria. Tech firm Andela prides itself as the best place to work in Africa, and this is part of the reason why. A crash for working mothers in the organization to take care of their babies while at work. It's not something common in both government and private workplaces in Nigeria, but it's become a standard practice here at Andela. Something Toby, a product manager at the firm and whose baby is also here, says is giving her peace of mind and make her function better at work. Imagine Andela giving me that option of, we have a crutch, we take care of your child well. And you know, there was that peace, there was that savings that I didn't have to spend so much. And I just felt really excited and I just felt, oh, this, this is definitely going to be a very good organization because what, that, what this actually tells me is that they are very big on female inclusiveness. It's the same story for another young mom who also works for the firm. Shayo Osemabo, a senior performance coordinator at Andela, is part of the team that created the crash for the firm. She says the initiative has been quite helpful for young working mothers in the firm to maintain a work-life balance. When she started um, here, um, I had to be in a lot of meetings um, because we're rolling out like a new product, um, a new performance uh, management tool. And so I had to like be coordinating that whole thing. And that means that I had to either come early or leave really late. Um, but the fact that we have the crash here and the 90s were, were willing to stay late or later um, really made me like comfortable. I was able to do work well. I wasn't, I wasn't like thinking that, okay, so my child is still in this place and I don't know, someone needs to leave. But the fact that my child was in this building and the nanny was here and I could also check in on her using the webcams that we use. Um, so it was really great. 
For many women, having a baby means a career pause. And because of limited support for mothers in the workplace, including childcare facilities and majority of the companies in Nigeria, some other women have had it worse. I've actually seen women who have had to quit their jobs in order to nurture their children. And this affects um, mothers in so many ways because then your growth in your career is, there's probably like a delay or a stagnancy and then you know when you have to leave your job, then getting back into the system sometimes is quite difficult. Companies should actually embrace supporting females, uh, yes, in the workplace. And the good thing is that her firm is one of the very few setting the pace in gender inclusiveness and supporting females in the workplace. Deji Badmos, CGTN, Lagos. Now, in South Africa, the idea of a lack of facilities for childcare in the office is all too familiar. But some companies are developing ways around it. This is as they try to make the office more conducive for new parents. With the details, here's CGTN's Sumitra Naidu. South Africa has a thriving private sector. The government has a ministry dedicated to women and children. Yet women are still feeling marginalized. I found only a handful of companies that provide office childcare for their employees. Green School in Cape Town is dedicated to the employees of Old Mutual. So Old Mutual Green School was launched in 2008. We opened on the 1st of April. Um, the reason being is that we needed good daycare facility and in close proximity to the head office where the parents were working. Being a new parent can be a challenge, but knowing that there is a place that can take care of your child just as much as you can is reassuring. This is a textbook way of learning what you need to and how you need to care for your child. And then you have to think of bringing him to school and you wonder if that is going to be the same way that the care is applied to your child. But I think the comfort comes in when you've seen how they treat your, your child when you drop them off, when you pick them up, the facilities of the school, the security of the school. So, so the transition made it easier and I felt much at ease from maternity leave going to work knowing that my child is in a safe secure and caring environment. Companies that provide crash services find their female staff are happier and more productive. I find that more moms are getting back to work sooner at their babies are three months old and they will be back at work because they know they have a safe space to leave their child. Also that the child is two minutes away from the head office so they can walk over at any time just to come and visit their baby or to breastfeed their baby. My experience has been um, great at Green School since day one. Uh, there was no need for me to check up on him. Oh, there's numerous of benefits, just the, the convenience of it. I'm not worried about a thing. I am so relaxed just being at work. They have in-house nurses, um, the staff is incredible. They have loads of activities. I know that in every aspect of his development, he's being catered for. So I'm happy, 100% happy. Good quality childcare is essential for proper development, but it's expensive. Often women are forced to leave their children with family and in some cases choose not to work and stay home. Sumitra Nadu, CGT in Johannesburg, South Africa. You're watching Global Business Africa. Let's take a quick break now. Still coming up on the show. China to impose additional tariffs on the US on US imports in retaliation on to a similar move by the US next month. And the new buzz title amongst Fortune 500 companies. Business in Africa is at a crossroads. We celebrate those who are adopting and thriving despite the challenges from grassroots to big businesses. Global Business takes you along for the ride as we track the making of a giant. Only on CGTN. With a dedicated and diverse team of anchors, CGTN now brings Africa to the palm of your hand. In, a Caribe, in the heart of Nairobi, which is bustling. From everyday heroes to the continent's most powerful figures. 
we bring their voices to you. We haven't changed. And, and this is something most of us are very excited about. We bring you news that's changing perspectives. News that brings Africa to the world. CGTN. See the difference. the hour let's recap today's top headlines malaria experts say current strategies for fighting malaria are not adequate to eliminate the mosquito-borne disease now the world health organization has a target of reducing the number of cases and deaths by 90 percent by the year 2030 but even with the most optimistic projections a team of scientists and public health specialists say the goal cannot be achieved yet now, at least five people have been killed in a stampede at a rap concert in the Algerian capital, Algiers. This is according to the country's local news site, TSA. The stampede is said to have broken out at one of the entrances as thousands gathered to see rapper Abderauf Deraji, better known as Sul King. Now, the incident left at least 21 others injured and are currently receiving treatment in hospital. Authorities in Somalia have announced a major security reshuffle targeting the army, police and intelligence. A new mayor of Mogadishu has also been appointed following the death of the former mayor in an Al-Shabaab attack on his offices. And still in Somalia, Ismail Madobe has been re-elected president of the Jubaland re region. Madobe won a hotly contested election in the first round of voting, garnering about 56 votes of 74 votes, which were cast by regional legislators in Kismayu. The central government has said it will not recognize the election, citing a flawed process. A rival group has held elections and elected Abdi Rashid Mohamed Hidig as president. Now, Jubaland is seen as a breadbasket of Somalia, and the capital, Kismayo, is a strategically important port. And that's a look at our top headlines. Well, let's turn to the ongoing trade war between China and the U.S. Beijing says that it will impose additional tariffs on U.S. imports worth about 70, 75 billion U.S. dollars. Now, the tariffs will range from 5% to 10%. Some of the du duties will go into effect as soon as September 1st. That's according to the Customs Tariff Commission at, of the State Council. The move comes in response to newly announced U.S. tariff hikes on Chinese goods. China will also resume imposing additional tariffs on American-made vehicles and, uh, and on auto parts uh, starting from December 15th. China had been warning this week that any new tariffs by the U.S. would escalate the situation and trigger a retaliatory response. Now, Chinese negotiators are likely to meet with their American counterparts again in September in Washington, D.C. to reboot the trade talks if there are no new plot twists in the trade fight. Meanwhile, two of America's biggest store chains recently announced they will have to raise prices if new tariffs on Chinese goods are implemented. Economists are saying that would hit lower-income Americans the most. Well, CGTN's Karina Huber has more from New York. Walmart, the world's largest retailer, recently warned prices at its U.S. stores will likely rise. In May, its chief financial officer said, our goal is to be the low price leader, but increased tariffs will increase prices for consumers. Macy's is also warning of possible price hikes ahead. The alerts came after the Trump administration increased tariffs on $200 billion worth of Chinese imports from 10 to 25 percent, and as it threatened tariffs on an additional $300 billion worth of goods, essentially all Chinese imports not already hit. Research by a group of leading economists published during the Obama administration suggests lower-income Americans are the hardest hit by tariffs. Their report says the burden of tariffs is five times as heavy for the bottom tenth of households as for the top tenth. 
That's because lower income groups tend to use more of their take home pay to cover basic needs and they tend to buy more low cost imports. I mean, why should prices rise? Just because of a trade. I mean, it has nothing to do with any of us, it has everything to do with politics and the government. Right, raise prices on the clothes, like that makes people not want to go and shop at Macy's just because of that. Retailers like Macy's are in a tough position. They may need to raise prices to cover increased costs, but they don't want to raise prices too much or they could lose business. Karina Huber, CGTN, New York. Meanwhile, Chinese tech giant Huawei has announced the availability of its first commercial artificial intelligence chip, pitting it against major American giants such as Qualcomm. Now, the chip, which is known as the Ascend 910, was first unveiled in October last year, and it is aimed at data centers. Companies using AI applications require huge amounts of data to train smart algorithms, which can take several days or even weeks. But Huawei claims that its latest Ascend 910 will process data faster compared to any of its competitors. Now, earlier at the launch event for the chip, a top Huawei official spoke to CGTN about the product and the company's goals amid escalating pressure from the United States. Ascent 910's performance in trial tests has been better than we expected. Looking into the future, we will continue investing in the field and release more AI processors. With a series of advanced processors, we hope to build new computing frameworks to meet the needs of AI development. Well, let's move on now. Now, plants, of course, need sunlight to grow, or do they? As indoor farming and smart farms become more popular, demand for sources of reliable light is also on the rise. In South Korea, much of that growth has been driven by horticultural LED light bulbs. CGTN's Shane Ham now reports. Tons of vegetables are grown in this smart farm every year, but not a speck of natural sunlight is used. That's because these plants rely on LED light sources that are designed to mimic the sun's rays. We try to provide the optimal artificial lighting that a vegetable would need. If a plant would take 50 days to grow outdoors, we can grow in about 35 days. Farm 8 is a leading South Korean agricultural cultivator that produces and distributes salad ingredients. Everything from lettuce to sprouts are grown in these vertical farm shelves. This one room alone at roughly 200 square meters can generate up to $10,000 a month in revenue, all with the help of a consistent light source using LED technology. The type of light a plant is exposed to will determine how it grows. Different wavelengths will affect the plant's taste and nutritional content. So it's a matter of finding a vegetable's optimized wavelength, or what is known as the ideal lighting recipe. So you got LED chips. We can arrange LED memory chips to create a plant's optimized spectrum by turning the RGB values, as well as the PPFD, or photosynthetic proton flex density. Semiconductors are the main source that power LED lights. South Korean companies produce nearly two-thirds of the world's memory chips. That's why local companies are driving growth in the global LED industry for horticulture, which is expected to reach over $120 billion over the next several years. We see future opportunities in smart lighting and converging solutions with AI. We are continuing to develop and invest in new lighting sources that focus on helping plants grow in a smarter way. Horticultural LED lights are more cost efficient than other artificial light sources. And as global demand increases for healthier alternative food sources, LED technology will be lighting a path forward. Shane Hom, CGTN, Pyeongtaek, South Korea. Meanwhile, huge numbers of tiny particles of plastics in water are set to pose serious health risks. And that's according to a new study by the United Nations. While most of the plastics are too large to be absorbed by the human body, many experts are saying an assessment is still needed. Here's CGTN's Owen Fairclough explaining. When this sperm whale was washed up in Indonesia, it had six kilograms of plastic in its stomach. And we humans are also ingesting it in microscopic particles like polyethylene terephthalate, or PET, according to a new study by the World Health Organization. 
We see PET and we see polypropylene, but within those plastics, even within, the, you know, there are additives. Plastic used in bottled water, a multi-billion dollar industry enjoying huge growth, is also a contributory factor. And if you think drinking water from a fountain or tap is a better and cheaper alternative, well, those tiny particles called microplastics are in that too, and they find their way in from surface runoff and recycled wastewater. The WHO wants more action against plastic pollution. One study found discarded plastic in the Pacific Ocean alone covered a surface area three times the size of France. Experts say while most plastic particles are too large to be absorbed into the body, they want more research on the chemical composition of those that can be. These particles are present in all waters, rivers, lakes, streams, wastewater, and even in our drinking water. So we are ingesting them, but just because we're ingesting them doesn't mean we have a risk to human health. And the WHO says the biggest current threat to human health is water contaminated with diarrheal diseases, blamed for nearly half a million deaths every year. Owen Fairclough, CGTN, Washington. Now, usually the chief something officer is usually used as the term for a top-level manager in a company. There's a new one around these days. It's called the CGO or the chief growth officer. It has become an increasingly popular position with big retail firms, especially world top 500 companies, as they replace their chief marketing officers with chief growth officers. Well, MeGIE explains exactly what's been going on. The idea of the CGO began at Coca-Cola in 2017, when the company first introduced the position. Coca-Cola said at the same time that the company was abolishing the title of Chief Marketing Officer, which had existed since 1993. Now, two years since the idea hit the world of management, the demand for Chief Growth Officers is on the rise. Just this month, McDonald's announced that it too would abolish its Chief Marketing position. Many are now wondering, will the Big M also set up a CGO for its business? And just what would that change mean for the company's operations? We asked an HR expert. Whether you look at it from the standpoint of the economic environment or consumer shopping behavior, you'll see that CGOs will have to take care of a larger scope of operations, including the company's future strategy, improvements in internal efficiency, and lowering operational costs. The goal is to push growth forward. CMOs, in comparison, looked only at marketing performance. As more and more companies adopt digitalization, it becomes easier to quantify the costs and outcomes of marketing campaigns. That means a chief growth officer who can optimize all aspects of spending and revenue, including marketing, can well be more efficient for a company than a chief marketing officer. A search on LinkedIn for CGO turns up just under 17,000 results. Research company Forrester predicted last year that eight Fortune 100 companies would replace their CMOs with CGOs. Since then, six of them have done so, and the numbers show pleasantly corresponding revenue growth. Jacqueline Chin is in charge of recruiting senior management for big companies in Shanghai and has recently helped one of her clients find a CGO. She says the growth of the CGO trend is becoming especially apparent in China. In general, I think the world is in the need of uh, see the CGO, uh, China particularly, because we are a very consumer-centric business here. Mm -hmm. So we already see the trend for domestic company, they start to hire more CGO than multinationals. It's the continued evolution of the business model and the company leadership structure. Ching says most of the companies looking for chief growth officers are in the fast-moving consumer goods and pharmaceutical fields. Because so much of their business faces retail consumers directly, and that is where they want the growth to come from. Mi Jiayi, ICS4 CGTN, Shanghai. And shifting focus now, let's take a look at how commodities perform today. We saw oil prices steadying today on track for a weekly gain. Now, of course, all investor and traders' eyes have been on the U.S. Fed's speech on whether it will cut interest rates. 
However, we did see oil production cuts from OPEC members as well as Russia. And of course, reduced exports from Iran and Venezuela uh, because of U.S. sanctions suddenly helping to continue to support crude prices. Meanwhile, gold prices easing today are set for their worst week in nearly five months. And that's as a lack of clarity from the U.S. Fed triggered investors to cash in on some gains ahead of that rate speech. Well, let's take a quick break now. Still to come. We'll examine the water-saving toilet that could address shortages in South Africa. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. And no one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN. See the difference. Now, Kenya's western county of Nakuru is not a traditional player when it comes to farming avocados. But the signing of a trade deal between Kenya and China in April is changing that. Nakuru is promoting avocado farming to cash in on the huge market provided by China. Kenyan avocado exports to China are set to increase by 10% annually over the next three years. With the full implementation of a 2018 deal between the two countries, Kenya will export avocado to China. The deal also includes providing seedlings to farmers who cannot afford it to facilitate for large volumes of the butter fruit. In Nakuru County, we are assisting the farmers to access uh, avocado seedlings for planting. Seedlings are expensive. One is about 300 shillings. So we have set aside some uh, funds to assist the farmers access the seedlings. For example, this year, 2019, uh, and we are able to distribute 113,000 seedlings growing among our small scale farmers in the county. Mm -hmm. According to the Kenyan government, Chinese traders are actively scouting for new opportunities in the Kenyan market to get avocados, and farmers are happy to have access to the new market. When Kenya and China start but we start selling to, to China, I think it will be a big market and uh, it will give us a breakthrough where we can sell our commodity. So we appreciate the offer. Although there's a three-year wait before they can reap the rewards, the farmers are excited about the project. I'm going to, to, spread, to spread that um, information to my fellow colleagues, youths, maybe, maybe through social media. So that uh, that initiative will get to many people here. I'm planning to plan 200 next year. Currently, Kenya's famous avocado destinations include Europe and the USA. Experts say that when the agreement is fully implemented, the Chinese market will take in more than 40% of Kenya's avocado produce, making it one of the largest importers of the fruit and subsequently improving the living standards of farmers. But more importantly, at the local level, we are seeing massive uh, improvement in economic sustainability. People will have little more money, therefore, you know, we raise the living standards. People can go to school, can be able to feed themselves, and so on and so forth. So there'll be better quality of life. So that as we see the big roads done by some of our Chinese contractors, we also can see uh, economies or people or communities that are coming up so that the relationship is both ways. Currently, Nakuru County is establishing an industrial center in Naivasha. In the future, after grading and packaging, the refrigerated containers of avocados can be sent directly to Mombasa and then on to China. Alexandria Majala for CGTN. 
Now, access to water and decent sanitation is still a struggle in many of South Africa's poor and outlying areas. But a team of plumbers have come up with an innovative water-saving toilet, which could be the answer to providing proper toilets and to address water shortages in the country. CGTN's Julie Shire has more. Moni Mukwena's childhood struggles inspired her to be a plumber. Her home in a poor South African village did not have running water or a flushing toilet. We have to go distance to collect that water and now we are sharing that water with the animals. On the other side, the toilet that we are using is not good. It's a pit toilet. It is located a distance from the house that we are dwelling in. So sometimes you have to go to toilet at night. What if people are talking? Mukwena moved to Pretoria. Infrastructure is better, but water is costly. The young plumber and her team invented a swallowing toilet. It uses less water than a normal toilet, which needs 13 litres with every flush and makes up a huge chunk of residential consumption. This toilet of us doesn't have a solid P-trap or a P-shape at the back. It has a flexible P-trap or S-shape at the back, whereby when you flush, that S-shape, it relaxes to the surface to allow the free movement of water, which consumes less than one litre per flush. When we install areas... It will help city dwellers who often face restrictions save on water and bills. But the company needs a huge cash injection to go into full-scale production. We are looking for one million dollars of whereby we want to secure a space and to look for the plant whereby we can manufacture the toilet and we can create a job employment and whereby on the other side saving water. Close to 90% of South African households are connected to a piped water system, but the reality is different in townships and informal settlements where infrastructure is poor. Many here still rely on communal toilets, and this new invention could bring back dignity by fulfilling a basic human right for millions of people. Chili Shara, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, much like the rest of the world, South Africa's so-called plus-size market has for long been an underserved retail market. This trend, though, is changing as the fashion industry there starts to embrace bigger-built women. While body shaming is still a problem, more women are speaking out and uh, taking action. Well, Sumitra Naidu visited a young fashion designer in Johannesburg who's catering for women that don't get enough attention in retail stores. Malisela Rachel, now famously known as Oma Tema, decided to turn her frustrations into a business opportunity. And she believes being big shouldn't stop you from feeling good about yourself. Plus that was never an inspiration at all. I really was struggling to get clothes. Um, the clothes that were in the retail store just suggested that I was a grandma. I wanted something that, that shows my cleavage a little bit, something that is tight in the right place. And so I just could not understand how come, you know, um, there isn't such a brand for fully figured women. Tema soon discovered an untapped market, but feeding this demand was no easy feat. The challenges I would, I, I would come across would be just entrepreneurial challenges so i think the entrepreneurial journey in the eight years that we've been working has just all just being able to sustain your your brand presence and um, that requires money and sometimes you don't have the money to do that tema is now breaking down more barriers to serve plus size women she recently launched a swimwear line one of the things that i've, I've really struggled with is that most of you know swimwear that you'll find in stores don't necessarily cover our calves. I've created a, a line that will cover all of that. You don't have to be scared. And if you are not so, you know, adventurous like we are, um, you are a little bit conservative, there is nice mesh skirts to, to like cover but see through. Plus Fab is fast becoming a well-known, proudly South African brand with factories in Johannesburg and Cape Town. We proudly produce our clothes in-house and we produce, we distribute them from here. Um, we, we really appreciate and love the fact that we are able to monitor the quality of our garment as and when it's been produced every step of the way. I have made sure that majority of people that are in my, in, 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 in my employ are women because I believe in, you know, um, empowering, economically empowering women uh, for, for a better life. 
Tema is now hoping to grow her business to serve a wider African market. Sumitra Nadu, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, a film titled Redemption is creating a new interest in Mozambique. The country's film sector has been struggling due to years of conflict and economic stagnation. Here's Brian Toussaint with this story. The film Redemption depicts the life of a young ex-convict who is grappling with new life in the city of Maputo. After realizing that his mother left him with a $30,000 debt and at the risk of losing his home, Bruno Pereira contemplates rejoining crime. Redemption is a film that signals the rebirth of Mozambique's film sector. Bruno Pereira. I play Bruno Pereira in the film. He comes home looking for a better life when he gets out of jail, but things degenerate and he's only able to make a living as a car thief and then as a kidnapper. A sector that was adversely affected by years of conflict and political instability. But this film is now telling the story of the present by being a mirror of the changing times of the now peaceful Mozambique. It was really important to tell the story because, first of all, it's a, it's a film that takes place in the here and now. It's about actual problems, problems, the difficulties that are happening today. Most of the films that have been made here in Mozambique are always about the past, you know. Uh, the topics are completely different to the ones that we approached. So we decided to tell a story, a contemporary story that's about now, that's... Um, that takes place in the city, you know. Newly independent Mozambique was a robust base of documentary films in the early 70s. This film seeks to revive the sector by harnessing local talent. But there are challenges, especially with funding. However, locals are loving it. I think the movie is very good. It represents Mozambicans well. It is top, top, top. There are great lessons and everyone gets their own lesson. But what I learned is that we cannot repeat the same mistakes when it comes to something that has serious consequences in life. Money is not everything. The family has to come ahead of everything. And we have to learn to be sincere with others. I love the film. I highly recommend it. The film budget of $350,000 was sourced through crowdfunding. Parts of the internationally acclaimed movie Blood Diamond were shot in Mozambique. While that was largely a foreign project, Redemption is local and features a local cast. Brian Toussaint, CGTN. Well, before we go, let's take a quick peek at Africa's currencies today. Now, South Africa's rand flat against major global currencies, giving up some earlier gains. That, of course, is shortly after it emerged that China was gearing up to levy air tariffs on $75 billion worth of U.S. goods at the end of the month. Well, that's it for this edition of Global Business Africa. Remember, you can send your feedback to the contacts on your screen. You can also uh, follow us on our various digital media platforms. From me, Uchero Koronkwa, and the rest of the team, thanks for watching.